I'm Russ Kickle. On this episode of American Reef, we're going to talk about Ritter Eye anemones. So more specifically, we're going to be talking to Roger Vitko, who had a Ritteri plow right through his pyre head. For those of you who've had that happen, you know it's not fun, right? And it wasn't fun for Roger. So if you ever see him, you know, at MACNA or some of the frag swaps or, you know, you're trading messages with him online, make sure you thank him for his time. Um, because, again, it's his lessons that ultimately will help us not make the same mistakes, or if we do make mistakes, well, we can kind of use some of his recipes on how he solved, at least prevent and minimize death in his tanks. Um, if you don't know Roger, you can check out some of the previous videos, but you can think of Roger as Tunzi USA. Um, again, he's much more than that, obviously. He's a father, husband, you know, a, uh, you know, a saltwater aquarium store owner, right? Uh, he's an advanced Aquarius with, you know, again, many years into the hobby, decades actually, right? And uh, again, these events are still happening to him, um, but it's very interesting to hear, again, how he solves and minimizes, like, the problem as much as possible and the tools that he used to do so. So again, a uh, very informative video. You'll, uh, you'll realize that this is actually part one of two or three parts. Um, one time back, I'll say about four months ago, Roger and I had a chance to talk, and uh, as such, we kind of captured the video. So again, this is part one of multi-segments that you'll see. This one, though, specifically deals with, again, that Ritter Eye Anemone. Now, if you're looking for American Reefs HPD, head on over to American Reef HPD, that's one word, dot com. So AmericanReefHPD.com. Remember to support my sponsors where you can. That's Bulk Reef Supply, Premium Aquatic, and obviously Tunzi. Again, good, honest guys that deserve a chance to earn that business. Um, you know, this week on Premium Aquatics, uh, they re actually released a video of a new little product that actually marries, we'll say, technology with electricity. And I guess most technology is married with electricity. But this little thing basically is kind of a, a sensor seeing eye kind of thing where it will either start or kill power based on kind of water levels, etc. And it's relatively inexpensive. Never heard of the, uh, the brand or the product before. And again, um, Premium Aquatics, you know, is showing us at least what that product is and bringing it to our attention. And again, I find a lot of value in that. So check Premium Aquatics out if you can. And uh, also on the Bulk Reef Supply, again, they have the Ultra Low Maintenance Series, which, again, I just find utterly priceless. Meaning, you know, they look at it, and if you're starting up a reef tank, and you want to try to start it up such that you are minimizing, minimizing excuse me, the amount of maintenance that you're actually going to have to do on this tank. Which, again, we all just don't have the time, you know, the excess time to spend on the tanks that we'd love to. Um, again, it shows you some of the things or some of the options that will help us achieve that end result. Again, so check them out, Ball Crew Supply YouTube videos, as well as Premium Aquatics YouTube videos. And remember, thank Roger if you see him. Good morning, Roger Vitko. Morning, Russ. How art thou today? 
doing pretty good. And I already knew that since we had the kind of chat beforehand, but I figured we'll just say it anyway. <laughs> so we're going to talk like what? Last time we talked, your tank was kind of like what? It was up for probably four-ish months. Yeah. And right. now we're, we're right about the, uh, well, actually, we're nearing the 11-month mark, so. Ooh. And have we had any major catastrophes? Oh, I've had a few mishaps. Uh, the I had an ick outbreak. Uh, that happened in late July. I lost uh, a Semilovartis butterfly and a uh, pyramid butterfly to that. And the um, I was able to get the outbreak under control. I saved my tangs and most of my fish. I used ozone, UV, and a, a diatom filter and did a lot of water changes. Well, why, and, uh, why do you think you had the outbreak? Well, I had uh, I had been introducing a lot of fish. I, you know, I've I've kind of rethought this, but at the time I was working from two schools of thought. One that past experience with quarantine tanks is they're highly stressful, especially for a larger fish, and you're almost guaranteeing that those fish are going to get sick. Um, you know, I've I've since seen some newer setups that aren't so sterile. Um, but at the time, my thought process was, hey, you know, I'm going to be adding these four inch fish really to do this in a way that's fair to the fish. I need something like a 65 or 75 gallon quarantine tank. There's no place to put that. There's no way the wife's going to go for a tank of water and glass sitting there with a fish in it for a month and then being, you know, barren for a while. Right. Um, and so I thought, you know, let's just put them, let's try to just find healthy sources for fish and um, pick them out carefully and, and add them to the tank. Uh, that generally worked, but, um, you know, anytime you add new fish, there's stress on the existing fish. Odds are fairly high that fish is carrying something. Um, you know, in hindsight, Probably most fish are actually carrying some sort of disease, but their immune system's keeping it in check. But once you add them to the cocktail that is your tank and <laughs> deal with all the other fish in there that are already established, there's a little aggression and the they lose their their fight to the disease. And then before you know it, you've got an outbreak. So, you know, I think uh, going forward... I, I, I uh, Leonard um, Ho had a tank and procedures, and that seemed quite simple. And I think going forward, I, I would do that. So, hold on, you you broke up for a second. Repeat that. Yeah. Said Leonard Ho. Yeah, he had an article on on uh, you know how to do a very basic quarantine tank. Uh, Anthony Concialdi from Reef Exotics forwarded it to me. And, um, you know, it was a very simple system where you just had a, a um, sponge filter and, and you went through a, a fairly simple series of medications and uh, took about three weeks and you had some basic uh, simple shelters for the fish. Everything could be cleaned easy and, and that seemed like a really good process, so... In, in small tanks, large tanks? I mean, what's the Yeah, this was typically, you know, saying, hey, get yourself a 29 or a 30-gallon tank. That that seemed to be about right. And I, I've since seen that, um, you know, some of my other peers in this hobby, they, they'll buy, a, a, like, a plastic tank, and, and that's something they can store away easily without worrying about glass breakage and where to put it. So Sure. And so then, as far as the ick goes, you're figuring, basically, yeah, you didn't quarantine, and at the end of the day, with everything that you were adding, and all the stress and all that sort of stuff, that's kind of what led you, or led the tank to kind of the outbreak. So your yeah. solution in the future is, you're going to kind of implement this, we'll say, an easier or simpler kind of quarantine method that... Yeah will be a, we'll say it, a temporary quarantine system where when you add things, you'll you'll build it, quarantine the fish, and, or is, you're going to do that for coral as well? 
Yeah, corals, you know, I, I'd always been of the school of thought, starting with the uh, aquacultured or, you know, the man-made rock, that I wanted a certain degree of the cooties that came in on the corals to, to help populate the tank. I didn't see how else I was going to get pod populations. Um, you know, some of those frags had uh, micro serpent stars on them and micro brittle stars. Um so I wanted that stuff. So I didn't dip any of my frags. I, you know, recently on Facebook, I saw that Sanjay had set up a new Montipora tank mm -hmm. and that he got those uh, Montipora eating nudibranchs and ended up having to just tear everything down. So I think going forward, I'll implement a quarantine procedure. I got the, the cooties I wanted, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there were a lot of those frags, especially from ORA, I got a lot of really good um, beneficial critters. I got stomatid snails and different things on there. And and I had a strong interest in wanting to preserve some of that life because you just don't get it with the um, non-wild rock. Right. And so to that point, then, <laughs> if it's wet, you're going to quarantine it, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, you know, seeing what I've seen lately and... and these are, you know, knowledgeable people that likewise, uh, I think Sanjay even did some quarantine um, and, and you know, the dips and that. But like you see, there's even people use that bear dip and you see that now and again something survives that, that the eggs can survive. So Right. And um, as far as the that kind of quarantine system, you said, is it documented out there on um, what? Uh, isn't um, Hose World the Advanced Aquarist? That's that's where it was. Yes. Yeah. Okay, there you go. So so if it's out there, then the viewers can at least search for that. Yeah. And, and um, how long of a quarantine process is it? Is it? Day? That's what his his process is a three week process, okay. um, and you know that's that's assuming that you see no no disease, and uh, you know it's basically uh, either using copper or um, um, the what is it prosequinine pros or no? Um, I get lost. <laughs> one, one of those one of those quinine derivative salts, and uh, and then you know having. If you see flukes, having like a praziquantel on hand and uh, an antibiotic. Got it. So. And again, roughly three weeks. And then after that, you break the system down again. Right. And you start it with tank water? Well, that was uh, the, the process he outlined there. You had, um, you, you could use tank water, you could use aged water, you know, you weren't really, you, you needed to have some sort of functioning biological filter, so the process seemed to be having a sponge filter or some media that was already in the sump or, or somewhere in your existing setup. Got it. Well, if that's the case, where are you going to get your sponge? Are you going to keep it sitting in your tank and, and ready to go, or how are you going to do that? I, I had figured I would, uh, you know, the one easy area I have is I, I do have that closed loop and I keep a sponge on that perforated pipe ah. and that could just be added to an airlift. So. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Because I know for me in my sump, I just throw it in my, in the bio balls that I've got, I just throw a sponge down in there and it's not that I've used it yet, but I'm yeah. like, Hey, it'll hold biological life and, help contaminate, contaminate my tank and hold things that I don't want to hold. <laughs> okay, so you had your outbreak of ick, and you kind of got that under control. How long did it take you to kind of get that under control? Uh, you know, I fought that pretty hard for about a week and a half, mm -hmm. and it, it was really bad timing. I left uh, Germany when I had it getting under control. all of my fish and uh, I, I all I could do was I charging it every 12 hours and I my UV I cleaned the sleeve in the ozone I set up on a timer to just run for 15 minutes every two hours 
And that was the best I could do. And I got lucky. I came back and, and it was under control. So, Okay, so you faded out just a little bit. What I heard was you had UV and you had um, basically you had that running every 15 minutes. Is that what you do with UV? But no, the UV I had running continuously, but I cleaned the sleeve and replaced the tube, so it was working at maximum okay. capacity. And then the the ozone I set up to run fifteen minutes every two hours to to um, ozonize the tank. Got it, got it. And so even though you had the UV running constantly, um, how long was that running constantly for? I mean, I keep the UV on perpetually. Really? Uh, but yeah, the the UV I, where I lapsed, I hadn't realized. You know, the the instructions say to maintain it. Every year you need to change the bulb. Every six months right. you need to clean the sleeve. Right. Well, the um, at six months in, that sleeve was just a solid crust of calcium. I mean, there was no way any UV was <laughs> having any effect. Right. So it's just something to keep in mind with UVs. They're definitely maintenance required if they're going to work at all. The bulb may be on, but you're not getting any any zap dosage to the right. Back and parasites so and and so in general terms though so you don't subscribe to the fact that from a uv perspective you know it's killing off the good stuff as well right i mean there's probably something to that i haven't seen it right. um you know most of the good stuff is going to be settled on the rock the glass the filters it's it's somewhere in the system right um I, the way I look at it is, you know, like right now I have a little bit of a Valonia problem. I can be a little more, let's say, less cautious about breaking bubbles when I'm trying to remove it. I, I try to do the scrape and siphon method. So yep. you've got the siphon in one hand, scraping up in the other. Yep. And uh, keep up with it that way. But there's some of those that there's just no way you can get a siphon in there or get both hands in the area. So I can just scrape them and pop them, and hey, hopefully the UV kills the the spores. And I'm I'm somewhat skeptical of that whole spreading by spores thing because the Valonia has got to be putting out spores anyway, whether I'm removing it or not. So I, I'm not sure that that's a valid risk. But sure, sure, yeah. And again, like, and to me, that's why I kind of like diving into some of the discussions because a lot of times. Um, my words of advice to most of the viewers are like, follow one person's recipe, right? In other yeah. words, like their system, follow completely as opposed to picking and choosing what other people say, because again, at least you'll have the same success that they have. And so at least if they understand your reasoning or your rationale, right? Again, it'll help them make those decisions, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the one thing I noticed a lot of times when any of us tend to pick and choose, we're, we're trying to do what we already believe or wanted to do and just find a justification for it, not actually pursue <laughs> the <laughs> truth. So. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, um, okay, so then how long were you in Germany? I was over there for two weeks. Uh, Felix Tunzi, uh, Axel's oldest son, got married. So I was over there for the wedding, and we did a little work at the factory as well. Married. So yeah. a, a joyous event, right? Yeah, yeah it, was, it was fun. It was a beautiful wedding. Uh, and um, I, I was going to say, was there anything fish-related at the wedding? It just, it, no, no, it was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was a very you know traditional romantic wedding, the horse drawn carriage and the whole bit. So awesome, oh, that's cool. Okay, so back to this. so you come you come back home and it was kind of a thumbs up right away, kind of not some thumbs up or what was? Yeah, it? no, I I had you know it was the first time leaving the tank unattended. I mean, I had. Um, two friends stopping by. I had backup for the other friend. I was like, you know, you come by every day and feed and you come by every three days and check up that he hasn't screwed something up. So, <laughs> so that worked out well. And But, you know, and they would text me updates, hey, this is happening, that's happening. But, you know, I uh, I don't know if in the 
in the last video, did we discuss the other disaster I had with the anemone being pureed? Or was no, that no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> we talked, but that didn't get shared yet with it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was my first catastrophe. That was uh, I had bought a new Ritter eye. That was back in was that end of uh, end of May maybe? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say late spring, right? Yeah. So I, I, I decided it was time to add the Ritter eye, and I, I bought one, put it in the tank, got it attached to the rock, watched it for a couple hours, seemed happy where it was, went to bed, came, came got up in the morning, every single fish is dead. I, I had like three survivors, the Bangai Cardinals, um, actually no, one, the male Anthea survived and the Mandarin survived, and uh, everything else the stinging cells being freed by the shredded up anemone. He went through a power head. That was, that was the end of the fish. The corals were unfazed. I immediately did a massive water change, ran carbon, um, you know, did everything I could to try to get the tank in order. Um, one thing I did, I added a big dose of hydrogen peroxide and I thought, well, maybe some prime, the Seachem prime would, uh, which I, keep on hand for my daughter's turtle tank mm -hmm. would would possibly get some of the cells out of there and at the time when i got up a lot of the fish were still barely alive so i was trying everything to save them mm -hmm. but yeah that was a complete catastrophe so the uh i sense replaced the anemone and then when i went to germany I, I, you know, that was like the, that's been the persistent nightmare is waking up and the anemone has been pureed again. But since that happened, I did everything I could to protect the uh, power heads. And I followed a friend of mine. And what he did was he bought like a, almost like a lettuce basket or like, you know, a little laundry basket looking thing. Right. And put some styrofoam on it and just floated in the tank with the anemone for a couple of weeks. So it could adapt to the light and uh, was protected <clears throat> and that seemed like a smart procedure so i did that gives you a chance to feed it a little bit and kind of get it settled in and stronger um well <clears throat> so that that let me um get it acclimated a little better and then like i said i protected all the power heads and the anemone is doing great so 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 let's go back to the 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 catastrophe first of all. The yeah. Part. Okay. So first of all, when you came down, right, yeah. and, and and you see, holy cow! You know, it's after a couple hours of sleep, the the fish are all dead, right? The water was cloudy and, you know, had a bunch of bubbly slime on the top. I mean, you know, the, what you would expect from a, about an 8-inch Ritter eye going through a power head. I mean, there was no no tangible piece of this thing left. I mean, there was like a little bit of the foot stuck in the power head. And, and you know, they are mostly water, so there isn't much there anyway. But, the um, yeah, it, it was... And you it was Big disaster. And you knew right away what it was? Yeah, because I get up and the first thing I do is check the tank. And I, I just kind of look around. And it's like, okay, everything's okay. And, and I was like, wait a minute. Fish are lying down. Where's the anemone? Right. It's like, <laughs> right, right, right. And, okay, so now which power head did, did it go through? Went through the stream three. At, at the time, I only had two stream threes, so... Okay. And that's, I, I wrapped those. I had, uh, you know, after the last time I talked to you, you talked to me about uh, putting in a screen top. Right. So I bought the BRS kit for the screen top. I made a screen top. And I had some extra of that mesh material. So I put three rounds of that so that the mesh kind of overlaps around the intake of the power head. And, um, you know, it's it's interesting because we actually had a talk about it at the company. I was like, well, this shouldn't happen. The powerhead comes with a sock. And I was like, yeah, the sock is so fine. And with doing the turtle grass and everything I'm doing with plant life, it, it just gets clogged. So the sock wasn't a feasible option for me. But they were kind of like, well, we provide something so this won't happen. I was like, well, it, it didn't 
didn't work in my application. So, and, uh, you know, I, it's something that we're looking at now for a better sock design for the pump. Right, right. So talk about kind of the beta test slash whatever, yeah. whatever you want to call it, right? Right. Well, and realistically, you know, a lot of the anemones people keep nowadays aren't that prone to wandering. And, and uh, you know, I mean, a lot of flower anemones, the uh, mini carpets, those tend to stay pretty stationary. Even your bigger carpets aren't that prone to it. It's pretty much going to be ritter eyes. And, uh, and, you know, then the other... Uh, bubbles can wander, but usually bubbles, once they're settled, and more than anything, that was it. It was, I added it late in the day. Um, I, I later added 260.55s to spot flow directly on the anemone. Right. And uh, that those things, along with the acclimation, now it's very happy where it is. It's exactly where I want it, and it has no tendency to wander. Right. So I, I had thought of it as, you know, this is a real risk, but I had thought my experience with anemones is they don't just detach, they walk somewhere. Right. So that never really occurred to me. I thought, well, worst case, I'll find it on another rock where I didn't want it. It'll just walk over there. Right. And so that was always an old trick was set up the rock you wanted on as an island. That way it can't you know, basically get to the edge of that rock and just say, yeah, I'm stuck here. Right. I'm not going to walk across the sand. So, that's right. <clears throat> and, and now on, and on your streams, right, you had it such that one was going right in one motion, right, for a while, and then the other yeah. one would go the other way, right? Right. Yeah. And I guess that, I guess that's the other, you know, I don't know exactly how to say it, but since you've got a lot of circulation in one pump, yeah. right, when it hits it, there's no chance, right? I mean, yeah, I mean they're they're you know four thousand gallons an hour. It's a pretty strong magnet in there. It has a fair, so I I think that that, but you know the it could happen with any pump because as right. the the friend of mine Joe that showed me the whole basket trick the same thing happened to him. So, you know, and he's, he's using, he's all uh, Neptune systems. So everything's Neptune, even the pumps. And so, right. And that, when I looked at his pumps, I was like, those openings are so small. How could this happen? He's like, it happened. Everything's dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, you know, and again, to me, that's why I look at it is the reason why we do the videos is so that for the hobbyists that are out there, the get a rid or I, Right, that have a pump. It doesn't matter what the pump, right? And they put it in their tank. You know, again, make sure you protect yourself because, again, these things happen. So that's the lessons learned. I mean, I think the main thing that that me and you know we both replaced our ritter eyes, and and me and Joe have had the same experience that it, it, you'll have success with a ritter eye if you feed it. That, that really is, you know, you read all this stuff about, oh, they're impossible. It's so hard. They shouldn't even be in the hobby. Where most people go wrong is this assumption that anemones are photosynthetic and, you know, that, no, they, right. I, I feed mine every day, every other day. It gets a large silver side, a big chunk of krill. I'll take, whole, you know, those live clams on the half shell and chuck them off the shell, feed them a few of those. The amount they eat is incredible, and that's that's really how you keep them healthy. Which is amazing when you think about it, right? Because to me, they're not that big to eat that much. Yeah, but and and you know, you wonder what they do with it because I never see. Uh, you know, now that he's really settled in, at first sometimes you'd puke up a, a whole piece of fish or something. Right. But I never see that anymore. So. Right. <laughs> Okay, so as far as the Ritter Eye, when did you actually get before Germany, after Germany? What what happened there? Uh, no, I put the replacement in. Uh, basically, I'd gone to Unlimited Color Corals in, in uh, Houston, and he had three. And Joe was with me, and these were uh, they were a color morph I'd never really seen before, but seem to be popular now. I've seen them on eBay and and elsewhere, mm -hmm. but they're they're more or less brown with uh, bright purple tips mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I really had my heart set on a yellow one but 
it seems that they're just not as readily available as they used to be. And from talking to people, they're like, yeah, those yellow ones come from Marshall Islands or there's some unusual color strains off the coast of Africa, but all that stuff's really spotty. You never know when you'll get it. Right. And we were like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm getting this anemone because I, I want to get some rose skunk clowns that a friend of mine bred. That's the only anemone these things go in. Um, you know, they might a- adapt, but in the wild, that's that's the one host. So Right. So I... I he had three. We had bought two. We both lost our two. And I I had messaged Chris asking him, well, do you still have that third one? He said, yeah. And so they, I ordered it and they shipped it to me. So I, I had it replaced once I was convinced that the chemistry was back in order and things were stable. And I added the extra power heads and, and had a game plan. So that was before Germany then, actually. Yeah, I think I put him in sometime in in late june i think i'd waited about a month after the first one got period and then um you had mentioned that when that happened you did hydrogen peroxide right yeah and then you said that uh secam prime yeah i mean i the first thing i did was about a 40 percent water change and ran carbon okay Um, and then you know basically i was thinking what, what would we do for stinging cells? You know, maybe we could oxidize them out of solution. Maybe, uh, you know, it would be feasible with all this decaying matter in here, there could be an ammonia spike, you know, and I, I started doing tests and that. I didn't see anything in any of the chemistry results except for the pH had gotten low. Um, so I figured, well, I'll add some prime. It's a detoxifier. You know, it's probably just sodium thiosulfate, which... Uh, you know, that detoxifies everything from cyanide to ammonia. It just breaks it apart. Right. So let's try it. Maybe maybe I can save the fish. So it was just kind of a shotgun, which, right. you know, I mean, I've had criticisms for my shotgun approach to other things, but when you're trying to save your tank, you kind of... Right. It's not always the best way to do things, because let's face it, you could probably make something worse, but... You try to use reason and say, well, these things shouldn't interact badly and maybe they'll help. So Right. And you did this after the water change. And, and yeah. All right. So after you did that. And then how um how long was it after? In other words, after you did your water change and your carbon, you let the carbon like run for a period of time first or I let it run for, for about two days. Okay. Yeah. And that, and, and then you hit it with the prime. Oh, well, I, the prime and peroxide I had done within, you know, as soon as the water change was done. Okay. So that was all in one fell swoop. And yeah. that was uh with 48 hours of window, you hit basically your water change, your carbon, and then again, prime peroxide. Yeah. And then after that, you crossed your fingers, said a couple rosaries, and, you know, you were... Yeah, I mean, the, the bigger fish, I had a tamini tang and a pyramid butterfly. Uh, they didn't make it. Um, I hadn't added the powder blue yet. And I had uh, some anthias. The females died. The male survived. I had the bang guys. They survived. And uh, the mandarin, you know, those mandarins... For as much as people say they're, I, I know the main thing is feeding them, but their ability to, th- to thicken their slime coat really goes a long way in something like this or the ick. I mean, they, they can just get themselves to where they look like a big snot ball and survive just about <laughs> anything. So. Which is amazing, right? Yeah. It really is. And, and so from that perspective, right, you'd look at it and say you had – it's still a good chunk of fish where I kind of survive. Yeah. And then you go, come back from Germany. The tank is looking good. Yeah. And you're kind of like, hey, okay, the worst is behind me. Then what's your thought process? Are you just going to let it go or what are you doing? Yeah, that was pretty much it. I was like, you know, let's just, chill out for a while and uh i you know after that i had magna coming up 
I did buy some corals at Magna, um, but I didn't didn't add any fish. And I still, I, well, I actually tried again to add a semel of artist. And now my problem is aggression. The powder blue is so established. He went in. I got him from Foster and Smith on their 4th of July sale. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he's been in there long enough that he's not too welcoming to anybody that comes in. Right. For the semel of artist, he basically started kicking his butt within seconds of going in. And, um, I, I tried a mirror and that worked, but it was too little too late. And so I, in the end I lost him. And I think now where I'm at is, is if I add anything, it'll just be, you know, small wrasses, firefish, things that aren't going to compete in that same space as the pyramid or as the powder blue to cause some aggression. Right. Right. <clears throat> and, in general terms, you're happy with the high, kind of the way the tank's looking? I am, yeah. No, I, I'm very happy with everything. I mean, it's been fun. It's been, uh, you know, a place to experiment with product ideas. Um, the, the main thing that I've had a few frustrations since, things I can't quite figure out why they happened. Uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a green torch. That was one of the first corals I put in yes. there. And it uh, it just mysteriously died. The day before it was fine, come home, and it's one head is completely sloughed and slimed over and dead. Mm-hmm. The other head's turning black. Um, you know, I immediately recognized, well, this is some sort of bacterial infection. It smelled like decay. I mean, it had an awful smell when I pulled it out. Right. But, uh, well, I'll, I'll rinse it under running tap water and the chloramine and the water. You know, all these things should the running highly oxygenated water that should check this bacterial infection. And, uh, then afterwards I put it in a dip of, um, the polyp lab dip, which I think is like a potassium iodide or, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly mild dip. And, uh, you know, that didn't work. It decayed the rest of the way. It took longer, but it two, three days later, it was completely gone. Um, and that was a mystery and, and I'm still puzzled by that one. The odd thing was I, I called Joe cause our torches, we have a gold and a green and we both, we bought the colonies together and split them. So he has a frag of, of the green and I have a frag of the gold. You know, we both have the same colonies and, um, his, he had the opposite. His gold did that. And it was right at the same time. And the only common threat is we both bought shrimp that week and we're assuming that maybe it ate some rotten brine shrimp or somehow the brine shrimp was the introducer of the infection but it's a mystery wow that is weird right and and my gold's fine and his green's fine so we're just like this is a really weird thing but right 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 amazing how that works right Again. Yeah, I mean, you would have expected. I also have a frog spawn. I mean, if it was some sort of rampant infection of euphilias, that they would have just all died, or you know, right. And then for both of us to have the same thing, we just can't. Out. Um, I also had a recordia dissolve, which was really bizarre. I mean, I, I have a colony of of ten recordias. One of them had split, so I have eleven now. And then uh, I had a yellowish orange one that just dissolved. And, uh, you know, it happened very slowly. It went down to one mouth and, you know, kind of was slimy on the edges. I never could figure out why that happened. The others are fine. but <clears throat> So even though the, the one kind of, again, dissolved, everybody else is still good. Everyone else is fine, yeah. And it, it sucks because it was my favorite one. It was kind of an orange-yellow Instead of just the traditional orange you see, it had yellowish colors to it. So right, 